So just settling into your seat or into your chair. Noticing how you feel physically. Imagining perhaps that your body is a friend who's just letting you know how they are. And as a wise, compassionate friend, you respond to them. By perhaps bringing your body a little more comfort and ease. So making any adjustments, finding perhaps your center of gravity, perhaps swaying slightly from side to side. Sensing that middle point. They are just sitting upright in a relaxed way. Perhaps also rocking gently forward and back from the pelvis. Very slowly just feeling in to gravity, to the position, shape of your spine. And gently, once again, finding that central point of balance, which is restful for you. So that your weight is fairly evenly distributed on your buttocks or perhaps for some reason it feels more natural more comfortable to have more weight on one than the other just noticing Noticing your knees. How do they bear the weight? Are they folded tightly or loosely? Is there anything you can do to give them a little bit more space? So they're not tense, squeezed, unnecessarily uncomfortable. If you're seated on a chair, you might want to experiment with where you put your feet. Are they straight underneath your knees, slightly back or slightly at an angle, just forward from your knees? What's most conducive to allowing that weight to really flow down into the ground through your feet? So that there's the minimum pressure Minimum strain on your knees. Feeling down into your toes. See if you can identify each toe.
whether they are squashed together or have space to move. If you're seated on a chair on the edge of a bed, See how it feels to very gently spread those toes so that you feel even more firmly planted, rooted into the ground, into the earth. And breathing in. Allowing your whole chest and abdomen to fill up with refreshing air, prana. Energizing the body and mind and then releasing. Sensing the contraction First in the abdomen, then in the chest. As the air leaves your body. If you wish, just taking a few slightly deeper breaths. Noticing the pause between each breath. A moment of silence. Relaxing any tensions, your face, your head, shoulders, on the out breath. Allowing everything to soften and relax. And gently letting go of any effort, any intentionality in your breathing. So that the breath finds its natural rhythm. Attuned to your particular energy. Just staying connected to the particular effect of the in-breath. Whether this differs slightly from the out-breath. Noticing whether there's any tiny pause between the two. Just allowing the mind to rest there before the next breath comes in.
Recognizing this breathing, the breath as life force. A sign that you're alive. And at the end of the out breath, not knowing whether the next breath will come in, not even anticipating, but just waiting quietly. As though each breath could be the last. Treating that breath with reverence. Not willing to miss a thing. But taking in each and every part of the in-breath as it enters, reaches its peak. And then turns into the out breath. Surrendering to the rhythm of the breathing. And just noticing if you can find that middle point between being aware, curious, alert to each part of the breath, beginning, middle and end of the in-breath. 
beginning, middle and end of the out breath. Whilst remaining relaxed. As though you were laying your head down on a very soft pillow. with your eyes wide open. Savoring every moment of each and every breath. Feeling a quiet sense of joy at the miracle of being alive.
Every moment of mindfulness, of breathing, is a precious moment. A moment fully lived, well spent. moment we can never get back again. So we just let it go and receive the next moment as though it were the first moment of our life. So we're coming close to the end of this meditation. Hopefully not to the end of our breath. The breath will continue to come in and go out as long as we're alive. See if you can remain connected to your breathing. I also invite you just to reflect on anything you've done today, which gives you the sense that you've spent your time well, you've spent your time wisely so that if this day were your last you could be happy for how you live today anything even the smallest seemingly most insignificant act of kindness gentle word whether you've been able to notice even one single breath 
Got something to rejoice in. Something that can give you confidence that yes, I've spent my time well. And similarly, looking back through your day, see if there's anything you could just leave behind that you don't need to carry into tomorrow. Maybe an unwholesome or negative perception or thought. An argument that you don't really need to pick up. A piece of work that's maybe already good enough. Whatever it is, if there's anything you can See would make your life a little lighter for leaving it behind. Just acknowledge that to yourself. And see that how that would feel. as an embodied sense, perhaps bringing some lightness, some relief. Dropping of your shoulders, a slightly longer breath out. So just ending this meditation with a few thoughts of loving kindness, appreciation or gratitude towards yourself. And towards your fellow meditators here today. May we all be happy. free from suffering, from burdens. May we all notice, connect to and develop the happiness, joy and contentment of living a wholesome, valuable life. I think I'll make a human gong today <laughs> because there's no resonance on the other one. <laughs> gong. <laughs> I didn't want to try the second time. <laughs> so that's enough, <laughs> enough suffering to end the meditation. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> hmm. So I had thought this evening about talking about a, a 
contemplation of death, but as I say, I decided my, <laughs> you like the voice gong, I decided my brain's a little tired and it would be better to save that for another day. But hopefully that gave you a little taste of how reflecting on impermanence and, you know, not taking each breath for granted, but being present to each new breath can bring a sense of um, vividness, a sense of clarity, help bring our experience into perhaps slightly starker relief and also help us drop those things we don't need yeah we carry so much in our lives in our minds in our hearts <laughs> that's only really weighing us down so i want to just open this up to any questions or input anybody here may have around meditation practice or could be on the theme of death if you wish uh, could be on any theme at all and uh, someone will have to be brave and start the discussion <laughs> otherwise your teacher will ask you the questions <laughs> and give you a little bit of direction so just gradually coming out. Yep, I think Tint has her hand up. <laughs> Thank you very much, Venerable, and have a good evening to all of you. And I just want to um, make myself uh, clear, and I just want to share my little bit of a changing of perspective. I hope you all can hear me clearly. Perfectly. Um, I, uh, I, about two years ago, I went to the uh, Sayaji Ugo Inga Meditation Center for 10 days. And um, I meant to have a very peaceful and relaxed experience that it was uh, in a contrast because I paid so much attention to the teaching and the practice. And at the end of the uh, practice, and uh, I was uh, advised and lectured that I should do the meditation uh, two hours every day and uh, to the rest of their life. So I took the advice so seriously and I felt I was in the prison. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and um, that uh, there was a sort of uh, like, you know, I know I need to do the meditation, but not with the joy and happiness. It's like I got to do the duty, not to go to the, you know, unpleasant places. And, uh, but it all, mm. all changed just because of your teaching. And gradually now my perspective changed and I don't even bother to take one hour or two. I just take in for just one breath in and out. And I'm very glad that if I can do just one breath yeah. with all the care and kindness just to myself and I'm very pleased and happy. So mm -hmm. my meditation become more and more um, enjoyable and the, the, the best time that I treat to myself so it is not longer anymore the burden or the duty. It's mm. a sort of um, the, 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 the very kind things that you, you give to yourself and all because of your teaching vulnerable. And thank you very much for that. Oh, that's and, so beautiful. And thank you. And that's all for my contribution. Mm. So much wisdom in there, Tim. Thank you for sharing. And it's really due to your wisdom <laughs> that you've come to that, you know, recognizing that anything we take upon ourselves as some kind of duty or something that has these seeds of potential failure, you know, anything that we think we must do in order to maybe be a certain person, be good enough, you know, prevent ourselves, like you say, from going to the lower realms or, yeah get enlightened at some future date all of that is just putting pressure on ourselves and of course it's not really the idea of committing to the two hours that is the problem there but it's sometimes how we take that up and um, I think this is one of the difficulties when we have meditation instructions or advice for people which is very general you know, so in that system, they're asking everybody do that two hours a day, but perhaps some people need that encouragement and that's very motivating for them if they tend to be lazy. 
But for other people who tend to be quite strict with themselves and already expect too much of themselves, it can actually be almost like the final straw. You just want to give up because it's so unachievable or, you know, you would do it no matter what and cause so much tension in yourself that um, that instruction doesn't work. So it's really, as I say, your own wisdom that's helped you to find the method that works for you. And uh, yeah, it's interesting how you uh, talk about just being with that one breath <clears throat> because that's actually the Buddha's instruction also for death contemplation. Yeah, there's a very nice sutta where um, he says that, you know, just reflecting that I might die tomorrow or that I might die in an hour is not death contemplation. Real death contemplation is being aware that I don't know if this is my last in-breath. I don't know if this might be my last out-breath. You know, then you're really practicing the path. And that is not to bring a sense of fear, but like you said, uh, it, it can bring a lot of joy, you know, because it's so easy also, right? It's so easy when we, we're just asked, okay, just be aware of this one breath. The mind actually is capable of that. And of course, if you're aware of this breath, and then the next breath is just one breath. The next breath is just one breath. Every moment is just one moment then bit by bit by bit it all adds up so yeah really really lovely thank you for sharing <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> see for me it was actually very wonderful to start with that um, particular system and uh those two hours a day were fantastic for me um, because I think unless I had something to strive for, I was probably too undisciplined to really uh, settle into the practice. But funnily enough, in my later life now, I'm much more fluid and flexible with how much and when I sit because I've learned it's not really about the length of time. It's about the way we use our minds, the way we direct our minds in everyday life, whether we're on the cushion or in a conversation or you know, in any situation, no matter what we're doing during the day. Even working on the computer can be practicing right livelihood or practicing some kind of service, right? That's something that I don't always recognize, but <laughs> this afternoon I actually did a little bit of uh, such service, which was quite joyful and quite uplifting because it gives us a, you know, especially when we can have a bigger perspective on what we're doing. So it's not just the mundane activity we're engaged in, but it's the why we're doing that, what it's in a greater service of. Mm -hmm. So James is asking a question about the practice of sense restraint. And this is a really wonderful subject. It's a huge part of the Eightfold Path and uh, the gradual training, actually. Um, but it comes a little bit hidden, I guess, under different names. Um, I think that sense restraint is very akin to right effort. You know, the two are almost synonymous, really. And um, to the extent that Ajahn Brahm's actually leaning towards translating right effort as right restraint and I'm not sure because I can certainly say that you know right effort is to not only restrain from the unwholesome uh, qualities but also to practice the wholesome to cultivate to develop the wholesome but in a sense he's correct because that's still part of right restraint so in the gradual training um Sense restraint is called Indriya Samvara Sila, and it literally means like guarding the senses, or you could say restraining the senses. Vara, Samvara means like restraining, but I prefer guarding or protecting the senses. So, what it really means is that, you know, as human beings, we are sensory beings. We have these six doors into the world, if you like, the sense doors. So the sense doors of the eye, the ear, the tongue, the nose, the um, body and the mind. And it's through these senses that input data comes in, right? So when that object outside comes in contact with our sense door, there's contact and as a result, there's sensation. 
and sense consciousness arises. So we have a certain kind of consciousness, which is like, oh, sight or sound or smell. You're aware of that smell. You're aware of that sight. And the thing with that is that if it would just remain at that bare level of knowing, there wouldn't be any kind of karmic outcome. It wouldn't necessarily cause happiness or suffering. It would be just simply knowing. Yeah, like in the scene, there is the scene. In the smelt, there is the smelt. In the herd, there is the herd. In the felt, I think, I think there's only three of those. In the known, there is the known, just pure knowing. But the thing is, unless our minds are completely free from hindrances, we're always going to be reacting with some amount of craving or aversion, some amount of wanting it or not wanting it, you know, um, wanting to indulge in it or wanting to get away from it. And it's, in that relationship that karma is produced and that we create for ourselves happiness and suffering. So it's not that sights and sounds and tastes are, are good or bad, but it is more in the way we relate to them, whether we're moving towards cultivating more wholesome states or we're moving into negativity, to, into um, a sense of aversion or maybe grasping, you know, or even perhaps delusion, just wanting to escape or wanting to kind of numb out or avoid certain sense impressions, pretend they don't exist, you know, just kind of go into a dull, drowsy state. So sense restraint or guarding, protecting the senses is really learning about how, what we do with the input that's coming in at the sense doors. Um, it can be about modifying how much, I think that's an important part of it. Um, because it can be very easy to get overwhelmed and almost flooded with sense impressions, you know. And for me, I'm extremely highly sensitive at that level. And um, so I need a lot of time out. I need a lot of solitude and quiet time. And I think, you know, it's, to me anyway, part of what's needed in order to just remain sane. Um, I would imagine that's the same for most people, and yet it's such a scarce resource, you know, silence, quiet, solitude, a space where you can just close your eyes, you know, even then you have the sense impressions of the day, right, coming into your mind, so they become mental objects. Um, so sometimes it is about reducing how much we allow in and also directing our mind skillfully. So at the moment, I'm actually doing an online course with one of my female teachers who's called Shaila Catherine. And she's talking about the five jhana factors, the factors that sort of um, intensify and um, come to fulfillment in the jhanas, in the first jhana, first of all. And, uh, and we're just talking about the first one of those, which is vitaka, which literally means like the mind... Um, directing itself to an object so it's that quality of mind which um, intentionally um, directs itself to a particular object and it was really interesting because she gave this little meditation whereby she said okay just sit down close your eyes and now notice any sounds you can do it if you want now notice any sounds Now notice the feeling in your big toe, either foot. Now notice the temperature in the room or on your skin. Now notice the next in-breath. And as you do that, it shows you that you do have this capacity of mind to be able to highlight one particular experience and let the other experiences that you could choose to be aware of fade away. So the mind has this capacity to choose to direct its attention in one direction and not in another. Yeah, somebody's mentioned being a musician and that was another example that this teacher actually used. She said that for a musician, it can be even possible to listen to, say, a symphony and to tune in to one instrument and to just hear the tune of that. 
for me that's also very easy because I'm very musical so I can hear all the different harmonies going on in say a melody and I can keep one harmony you know I wouldn't be swayed by all the others because I can pinpoint each particular part of that music but yes, I agree also that um, when you are very musical, it's one of the reasons I stopped listening to songs because on my first few retreats, I just had a jukebox playing the whole time and it wasn't unfortunately all my favorite Led Zeppelin. <laughs> it was actually rubbish, like Kylie Minogue, sorry Kylie. Um, but it was all this pop music <laughs> that I'd never listened to in my life, or at least I hadn't thought I had. But of course it all comes in, especially if you're musical. And the worst thing was that I knew all the words. <laughs> and it was two or three years into my practice life, and I was doing at least four or five retreats a year, plus serving on at least the same. Even when we served, we would sit five or six hours a day. So it was a lot of meditation. But still, it took a long time to kind of <laughs> burn out. And now I don't have that problem so much. But that's one of the reasons why for me, it's not, a, it's not an inconvenience or an imposition not to listen to music. It's actually very, very helpful for my practice. But I'm not saying that people, you know, that that's the answer, obviously, if you're in the lay world. Um, you will be more attuned to music. So it may be just more about, you know, when you listen to that music and how much space you might leave yourself to have some silence or perhaps the type of music that you prefer. And you might find that changes. Like now, I wouldn't really go for Led Zeppelin, you know. <laughs> I don't know what I'd go for really, but um, that's very emotive stuff. It's actually very brilliant too. <laughs> <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know but it's very emotional um and you know intense so your taste will probably change in time and you'll be able to gravitate to those things that calm and soothe the mind so that's part of sense restraint noticing the effect you know of the various sense impressions on our mind and whether that's leading us to cultivate um real happiness inside so what is most conducive to beautiful qualities arising, qualities of inspiration, gratitude, love, compassion. You know, you can choose what aspect of a person you look at. You can look at the ways that they behave that irritate you or the ways that you find really difficult to deal with, or you can look at the, where that person's coming from, what their real motives are, the way they're trying to do their best in the world. You know, even if they're not seemingly trying to do their best or you don't think they are then having compassion for that you know realizing that they're suffering and that's why they're perpetuating harm so we can learn to reframe our judgments our assumptions of others in ways that actually do us a little bit more good and lead us to more of a charitable perception um, that gives us room for developing compassion and wisdom and also seeing that, you know, everything that manifests is due to causes and conditions. You know, so how can we really judge? Things are the way they are because of what went before. We are the way we are because of everything we've experienced so far in our lives, right? So why should we judge ourselves? If we'd have known better, we'd have done better. but now we know better, we can make a new start. So it's a big topic and it's a beautiful topic. And it's also something that um, is a very important bridge, I think, between our practice on the cushion and our daily life. Because sometimes it's too easy to just get up from your cushion. I do it too. And I think, okay, you know, I'm nice and peaceful. I'll get up and I just go, I like spring back into ordinary speed or into an ordinary mode. And actually there can be a place in between where you're not so connected, say, with your breath, like I'm sure that most of you now have probably moved away from the breath and are more in a kind of, uh, you're aware of more different stimulation, maybe the sound of my voice, the meaning of that, maybe some of the things in the room, your cup of tea, you know, there's more sense data coming in now. But um, sensory strength helps us to just gradually widen the sphere of our awareness. 
So one of my other teachers called Bantu Jagra, he's a French Canadian monk who um, has lived and practiced in Sri Lanka and Myanmar since, as a monk since 1979 actually, but he's now back in Canada. And um, he drew this beautiful chart for us when we were on one of the retreats with him. And he showed how in the practice of Samadhi, the object and the mind are basically together, they're unified. So it was about the distance from the objects. So in Samadhi, they're together, you know, of course it starts off here and then it becomes like completely unified. In Vipassana practice, there's a little bit more distance from the object because you're observing and also analyzing. So you're moving a little bit around it. In mindfulness, ordinary sort of mindfulness, or like not so in depth mindfulness as Vipassana practice, you're a bit further away. You're getting more of a general sense of what's happening. And sense restraint, yeah, sense restraint is one further, slightly further away. It can also be more or less with mindfulness. They sort of go around each other, but it's just a slightly more distant from your object. So for example, the way we'd practice on that retreat was we'd come out of the meditation hall where it was either close or a little bit far, depending whether we were practicing Vipassana or Samatha. And then we'd come out and we'd yeah, just understand that the object's coming in, there's a bit more space between us and them. And that means there's more space for us to kind of play with, like there's a bigger relational field, if you like, and to just notice the impact of those sense impressions and to see what we're doing with that, how we're relating in that space. I don't know if that makes sense, but I found that another really nice way to see it because sometimes we think that's not meditation, but actually it is. It's just that it's a broader sphere of awareness. So that's quite a lot on sense restraint. And I can see someone else has their hand up. I hope some of that was helpful and you certainly don't have to pick it all up. So. <laughs> but I'm actually giving a whole day retreat on a similar theme next weekend. It's called something like beautifying the mind. And the idea there was to talk about ways that we can do that uh, using sense restraint. It's an aspect of mental virtue. So I'll take one more question and then I think I'm going to put you into groups and we'll have some more after that. Good evening, everyone. Good and, evening, uh, Ricardo. Um, um, I have this question. So I really liked the last uh, Friday when you gave us um, some connection between uh, letting go and Nibita. And of course, we already know uh, because you have already uh, kind of uh, told us extensively about the connection between the other two um, components of the second factor of the operator full path. Together Sorry, we... oh. can I just catch what you said in the beginning? The relation between mudita and? Letting go. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. And on the other hand, we know that uh, kindness and gentleness are, of course, uh, related to uh, metta and karuna. So my question would be, um, is there any other relationship between the four Brahma Viharas and the factors of the innovative part of this? Wow, that's a big question. That's a beautiful question. Yeah, I'd have to think about that for a while. But um, I mean, because we've just been talking about sense restraint, that's the thing that immediately springs to mind, that there's a definite relationship between the Brahma Viharas and right endeavor, right effort. Because right effort is about cultivating the wholesome states. And certainly one of the ways to cultivate those wholesome states is again to relate to our experience with a lot of kindness, a lot of compassion, mudita and equanimity, but also to know which one to use when, so that that right effort also has an element of discernment, an element of wisdom within it, you know, because it's not always appropriate to respond with metta to suffering, yeah. I always feel slightly jarred when I read about, you know, the situation in Burma or the situation in India and people say, may they be happy because they're not happy. 
it's anything but a happy situation you know I mean there may be people who are still contented there may be people practicing in deep meditation who genuinely are happy from within but to wish upon people who are suffering intensely intensely that they may be happy is just too big a distance too big an ask and at that point in time that loving kindness would be best um most wisely um developed into compassion and i actually think the human mind and the wisdom that's innate within us is incredible because most of the time that is what arises you know when loving kindness meets suffering it has a different flavor it has a different taste and it's much more a wish that beings be freed from their suffering and I think in a way, the more we can tune into that suffering and even get a sense of what it might be like, you know, try to empathize, put ourselves in their shoes um, to a certain extent, not to the point where we get flooded and overwhelmed, but as far as we can to really sense, gosh, what this really means, then the compassion that arises will be very genuine, very heartfelt, and it will also um, include an appropriate response. So we'll be better placed to know what might really serve those people. You know, if we think, oh, the problem is because, I don't know, because people aren't um, behaving properly or <laughs> when actually it's because there's a lack of distribution of oxygen, for example, you know, then we know where to put our energy. So in that way, I think it's really important to develop empathy as well as part of compassion. So certainly the Brahma Viharas come in right effort. Um, but I think they come even in right view, because in the Majjhima Nikaya 51, and there's a lot of other suttas, I think one, two, five, but certainly in 51, right at the beginning of that sutta, before the Buddha teaches the gradual training, he asks this particular person, I think, I forget their name now, um, that there are four types of people in the world. There are those who um, inflict pain upon others and themselves. There are those who inflict pain upon others, but not themselves, themselves, but not others. And then there are those who don't inflict pain upon anyone. And he asks, which person is superior? And of course, this person says, oh, the one who doesn't inflict pain and suffering upon either is superior. Uh, because all beings desire happiness and recoil from pain. And I just think that's such a beautiful summation of human beings and the human condition because we're all the same. You see that in insects and animals. I can't understand how people can say they don't have feelings because you can see that they just run away immediately as fast as they can at lightning speed <laughs> from anything that looks like a threat or a danger. You know, some people say, aren't the birds cute? They're kind of like... Ch -ch 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 -ch. But you know, they're just terrified. They're just always on the alert, looking out for the slightest thing that could endanger their life. You know, we can see that suffering in, in beings. And it's from that understanding that the gradual training takes off. Because when we realize that all beings desire happiness, compassion arises. We can't hurt others if they're desiring happiness. Why would we hurt them? You know, we want to bring about their happiness. We want to encourage and promote their happiness. So it becomes the place from where the Buddhist teaching starts in a powerful way, because of course the next step is to hear the teachings, to hear the Dhamma. And you already have the volition that beings come out of suffering and then you hear the teachings. It's like, ding, I knew I wanted this. Now I know how to do it. So for me, that was like probably the breakthrough moment of my life. You know, I knew I was suffering. I knew I wanted to find a compassionate response passionate way to live in the world suddenly I heard the Dhamma teachings and I was just this is it this is it you know I don't know I guess the next best thing would to be actually be enlightened because that was just such a massive relief it, it completely turned my life around um, so I think it comes all along the path and there are relationships between those Brahma Viharas as well as I said you know to um, to have compassion rather than metta, when there's a lot of suffering, but also when that compassion may turn into empathetic distress or feel heavy or, you know, give you the impression that the whole world is suffering, to turn towards mudita, to remember there are people who are actually happy and content and even rejoicing, even 
blissing out, especially in Perth, <laughs> and I'm sure many other places as well. Um, and to bring that to mind, to balance the compassion. Mm -hmm. And then also when we have practice with these Brahma Viharas, sometimes there are people or there are situations where we really feel they can't really be changed. And then the mind tends to move into a sense of acceptance, a sense of equanimity. But again, informed by the Brahma Viharas, it's not cold or indifferent, but it's just accepting that ultimately all beings are the heirs to their karma, you know, and they will reap the results of whatever actions they've done. So our efforts can only go so far. Yeah. So I hope that gives a few more ideas and examples. Great. So, so that I can, as I have promised to give you opportunity to meet together, I would now like to suggest going into some groups. And it looks like you're coming back smiling. But are you still as many? Not quite. We always lose some, that's the thing. But hopefully it's worth it for those who stay. <laughs> so we've got not much longer left, but I'd love to hear any feedback from anyone who wants to share how that felt for them. If you feel like you don't have to, you might not want to. Okay. Are you giving permission, Derek? Oh, yes, please. Crystal and Eric, you're welcome to speak. Well, I would just to thank you for this magnificent uh, little 10 minutes because both Crystal and I were so tired, but we were energized. We were talking a couple of minutes with Shirley. It was wonderful because we, we all three of us realized that we were actually bathing in the present moment because we were actually talking about it and then we realized we were in in the present moment all three of us it was quite a wonderful yeah. feeling oh. and uh just before ending shirley asked where we came from so we we, we cut off we're from actually sitting in sweden shirley i'm sweden and crystal is from france <laughs> so yeah Thank you very much for this wonderful moment. It was really precious. Thank you very much. Oh, great. Beautiful feedback. And uh, yes, I think you've touched on a couple of things there about how it can be a meditation in a sense. Yeah. So Shirley also wants to comment. Yeah, I just well. want to thank Christel and Eric, and it's always nice to meet people that we see on screen. And we had a had a, 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 a whatever rubbish is going on when we realise that it's actually going on in this moment, and we can know it and meet it with kindness. I think we all, the three of us, just agreed what a what a great, great treasure this was, and how transforming how transforming oh. it can be. So, uh, I mean, I learned that from Madeline Brown, but every time. I come to this meeting. It's it's a reminder to be a good friend to myself and whatever's whatever's coming up in my mind. Um, and I did a I've done a two day retreat at London Insight with Ajahn Suchito on the floods, and my mind was a sort of mess all the time because I've got I've got something going on that's been agitating me. But I've been able to I was able to meet it with and even the planning mind, even the forward thinking mind. I thought. I know it, I can know this, if I can know it, it's that's actually happening in the present, the thought of the future is happening in the present, and I can still meet it with kindness. And even, even the planning mind didn't have to be an enemy in a more, anymore. Lovely. And it's, it's all just such a gift. So, Very nice. Thank you. thank you, Shirley. Wonderful. I can see that Manomi also would like to speak, although she can't raise her virtual hand. Hello. Hi. We had a very nice conversation about mindfulness and uh, sensory restraint. And we all realized that when you go for retreats and when you do a lot of meditation, now we don't feel like 
watching that much of TV and we kind of feel all the distractions. We realize the distractions, identify the distractions. Um, for me personally, I had a, uh, I started doing mindfulness, not like meditation, in addition, putting an hour of mindfulness and trying to be more mindful, mindful during the day-to-day -day practices then I realized it's not only body, but then you have to be mindful of the thoughts as well. So that is something I kind of realized after about four weeks of trying to do only the body. And I, I knew something was wrong and then I wanted to ask you, but this morning I kind of, you know, lost reading some things and then I realized, yes, it is mindfulness of the body, speech and the thoughts as well. Mm -hmm. So, Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Great. The mindfulness that gradually includes more and more. Yeah. Lovely. And uh, Kristen also said she's happy with the groups and spoke to Tint, who is very kind and supportive. Tint have a lot had a lovely chat with Christy. Kristin. <laughs> Great. Well, we've come to the end, actually. So, gosh, it seemed to fly. <laughs> Thank you very much for being willing to participate in a slightly different session. Um, from time to time, we do have these breakout groups. Um, but yes, I like to do it only occasionally because some people prefer not to do that. But as I say, it's often surprising and hopefully enriching. And I'm glad to hear the positive feedback from those who shared. So. Thank you very much. And I'm going to invite whoever has offered to do the last few words. And then um, there's a couple of events I'm going to share. Oh, thanks, Venerable. Um, but you're so kind and generous with your time and your energy. And um, I know we all really appreciate, you know, some, somebody else might have said, I can't come tonight. And you don't do that. You come, you show up <laughs> every time with your beauty and your grace and we're so grateful. And I think the community's really enjoyed the um, chance to speak to each other as well. So what a wonderful session and a wonderful meditation. And um, so big thank you. And then just a quick word on the subject of Dana. Um, as we know, um, all of these sessions are freely and generously offered. And uh, in order to support Venerable Chanda sharing the price of Dharma with us, it's really wonderful if we're able to practice uh, offering generosity ourselves so that we have this mutual relationship and um, uh, as you know there are many ways um, to offer dana uh, and the links on the website show much needed items but i think at the moment it's mostly towards the running of the costs um, and uh, we've had a, a the newsletter in regards to looking after venerable when she goes on her reign so i'll, I'll leave it there and uh, thank you very much for all of your support everyone Thank you for your very kind words, Mel. It's um, very touching and always lovely to be here. So, yeah, I come not just for you, but I come for me <laughs> because I love this community. I, I just really enjoy being here and sharing whatever needs to be shared. And it's quite funny because today I was like, oh, I don't think I've got anything to share, you know, but that's just, again, one of those little kind of feelings that comes up that I'm learning not to believe in because things just spontaneously arise and um, it's really great when the Dhamma can be just responsive rather than pre-thought out so but I still do want to do a new thing on death contemplation one day so we'll see how that goes but actually the next session won't be for a while because uh, next weekend, May the 9th, I have a day retreat. So for anyone in the right time zone, at least, I think it's from 10 till 5 UK time. I think that's a bit early in America and I'm not sure for people elsewhere. Um, but that will be on beautifying the mind. So I do want to talk about sense restraint and how we can use perception just to bring about, you know, happiness and um beautiful qualities in our mind that really help us on the meditation cushion. They help the meditation to sail smoothly because we've already done so much of the preparation before we even arrive 
on our seat. So we'll see how that goes next on the 9th. And two weeks today, <laughs> I was just realizing it's only two weeks today until our retreat with Ajahn Brahmali will have begun. And that's a seven or eight day online retreat. I have done absolutely no preparation whatsoever, um, <laughs> which is again, slightly out of character, but then again, he'll be doing most of that. So again, we'll see what happens, but I know it's going to be incredibly rich because Ajahn Brahmali is a wealth of knowledge about the suttas and how they apply to everyday life. He can talk, you know, in quite a lot of depth about the Buddha's teachings and link them up and see the whole kind of framework of uh, how the teachings kind of uh, come together, really, and reinforce each other. And yet he can express it in a very clear and practical way so I'm really looking forward to that and I think a few of you are joining there are still places if anyone else has the privilege and opportunity to take eight days off work otherwise we'll be live streaming everything and also we have a great team behind the scenes who are going to try and get them posted up probably the same day or the next day so you'll be you know just a, a breath away from each session there'll be about three recorded sessions every day so you'll be getting plenty even if you're not able to uh, be there in person or on the live stream uh, so during that time there'll be no other sessions there'll be no um, I think I'll still do the chanting I think that's planned I think because it's only half an hour and it carries people you know anyone who's not in that retreat can still join the chanting otherwise uh the meta sessions and the q and a's and the dhamma talks and sutta class will not happen between the 16th and 23rd but we do have an extra one an extra sunday evening at the last sunday of the month to compensate and that's special because i'm inviting a bikini sister there aren't many but another bikini will join from new zealand and uh she'll be there on the 30th of May, Sunday. Okay, so I think that's everything and I hope I've left nothing out. So our next session is, what day is it now? Sunday. Uh, Wednesday chanting, Friday sutta class. Okay.